real life intrudes into your work and how um, you either can listen to it and put it into it or try to uh, um, ignore it. And I, I usually choose to sort of put everything that's going on around me in the world, what I'm reading, uh, what I find intellectually curious into the work, no matter what the story is. So let's turn our attention a little bit to these characters. You've created, is it nine, I think, altogether mm -hmm. characters? that are all extremely different from very different backgrounds. And you spoke just now about um, wanting to find an authentic voice for each of them and working from the inside out. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about creating uh, specific voices for um, a Jewish-Russian character by way of Yokohama, for an African-American character, for all these different characters? I know that you, you worked with specific actors. Did they mm -hmm. help at all? What was your, what, what happened? What was the process there? Well, absolutely. In, in terms of the African-American characters, um, I wrote this piece initially uh, for the um, ACT core company, and I thought it would be a great challenge to write, actually write a play for the core company. And the core company has two African American actors, and so I had tailored two of the two of the characters um, for Stephen Anthony Jones and uh, Gregory Wallace, I believe his name is Gregory. And um, and it's interesting that Gregory Wallace, an African American man, was supposed to play Mr. O.G who is an eccentric Japanese-American Nisei who likes Russian literature. And um, I thought it would be sort of an interesting thing to do. You know? and, uh, but after a while, we did a reading or two, and we realized that as good an actor as Gregory is, <laughs> that was, that was pushing, pushing his limits to play a Japanese-American uh, Nisei uh, guy in the late 40s. Um, Plus, a much, he's a much older character. I imagined OG to be older somewhat. You know, he was originally, but this is sort of what happens in the course of writing the play and the course of the act of using various actors, he became younger. Mm. So now the actor, uh, <laughs> who's a Chinese American actor, Francis Jew, who plays Mr. O.G., um, is more like a character in his mid to late 30s, uh, sort of eccentric, a career bachelor who's into Russian literature, uh, and who fa fashions himself kind of patterned after the Japanese artists of the 30s and 40s. So he wears a beret and he has uh, his round sort of glasses. Um, but getting back to the question about um, creating characters, for example, African-American characters, um, I, I'm always a bit cautious. In fact, I had written another play called Yohen that was about a, an African-American GI and a Japanese uh, wife that got married in post-war Japan. And I wrote that play 20, uh, 20 years ago. And I, I wouldn't do it for about you know eight years or so because I just didn't feel comfortable about being a Japanese American writing an African American character. And, and you have to think about too, like you know, this whole idea of political correctness you know, has both an upside and a very bad downside. And one of those is people tend to be very cautious and not want to try things like that. Um, I eventually, through my relationship with Danny Glover, pulled it out of the, you know, the, of my drawers and, uh, <laughs> out of my drawer, sure. <laughs> the drawer, desk drawer, and, um, <laughs> and we read it, and, and Danny was instrumental in saying, you know, you should just, let's do this. He said, let's just do this. But again, it was me working with some African-American actors, and I actually had it vetted by um, um, August Wilson, you know, kind of read it and checked it out for me. And there's another fellow who wrote Soldier Story. Charles Fuller took a look at it because I wanted to make sure that, you know, my bases were covered. Um, but so this new play, what I did is, uh, I feel comfortable writing the characters, but you're never sure. And, and one interesting thing happened was, uh, Stephen Anthony Jones helped me a great deal with the African-American characters. We took it to Sundance, Carrie Perloff, myself, and several actors. And we brought in, you know, when you go to Sundance, you bring some actors, and also some are given to you. And uh, I hadn't worked with the African-American man and the woman whom we teamed up with at Sundance. And uh, both excellent actors, but people whom I didn't know. So we didn't have uh, a working relationship. And so there were moments when we worked where, you know, I could tell that the fellow in particular wasn't happy with his character because I had him standing there while the Japanese-American character went on and on. And finally he said, hey, Philip, you know what? 
I would not stand here and take that crap. <laughs> you know, the moment he opened his mouth, I would just say, stop. You know, um, I thought, oh, okay. And, and so it, it wasn't contentious, but what it was is that area of discomfort. I think all of you know, it's in, racial politics are very tricky this day and age. And if you want to really start to address certain things, you have to go to that area of discomfort. And you have to go to that area where uh, you may even have to go into this area beyond discomfort of being kind of slightly offensive to each other. As long as you're in a context of trust and saying, this is, this is an art piece we are working on. We are working for the truth of the characters. And so at Sundance, I worked with two, in terms of the African-American characters, two generous actors who were willing to, with myself, uh, kind of spar a bit to make sure that what we ended up with, with was a truthful character and a truthful relationship between the African Americans and the Asian American characters. And that it was one in which both were speaking truth to truth. You know, uh, one character wasn't just a sounding board for the other. That in fact it was truth talking to truth, right versus right. And, and that's a difficult thing to sort of construct. And it's difficult to sort of do uh, if you want to get into what I call in-house versus out-house talk, you know, there's all this sort of in every community you have what goes on inside the house in your own community versus outside of it. You know, it's sort of like Charles Barkley is someone who on public television will say in-house stuff and embarrass other African-American athletes who are kind of trying to represent themselves in a, in a good manner. Um, so that's what I try to do is to kind of work from the inside so that what is said is what is normally not spoken outside of that world. Because that, to me, is when you get into the kind of juicy stuff. And so that is an instance where the African-American characters were definitely elevated at Sundance. And it's only because uh, I've worked with these actors, and I continue to work with African-American actors who uh, give me a lot of feedback on their characters. And, and women always do this to me, too. Um, there was one, uh, one workshop we did an actress, African-American actress, uh, Michelle Shade, just said to me, you know, Philip, an African-American woman really, you know, would protect the, the, her man's manhood. The, you know, she wouldn't just, like, let him kind of go out there and there's this interracial romance that happens, you know, this whole thing between black man, white woman, another African-American woman, and how this is all viewed, the sexual and political dynamics of that. And she said how she felt her character had to really stand up and try to protect her man. And so as a consequence, it became part of the, uh, the storyline where the African-American woman will not tell Earl Worthington that, in fact, his wife, her sister, his wife, has actually left him already and has run off with another man. She doesn't tell him that because she's trying to protect his manhood. Um, so those are things where if you, I think if you're a smart playwright, you really take advantage of your very smart actors and your very smart director. And again, this is this thing of where it's always coming down to ego, you know, at Sundance, uh, in every rehearsal process. And this one, I, I like to be a part of a very generous workshop. Uh, and if you were in there, you would say, wow, it's pretty freewheeling. But my feeling is, in certain contexts, for example, you have nine characters, nine storylines that, you know, all are trying to be sort of pieced together so that they all are introduced, they all intertwine, and by the end they all resolve in some form or fashion. Um, it's not an easy thing to do because if you tweak one thing over here, then the whole structure sort of is affected and the balance is thrown off. So it's such a delicate architecture. So as we're in the rehearsal process, you know, we, uh, I really rely on actors to kind of say at some point, you've tweaked something here, but then my character on this part of act two no longer is in the right place, and so we have to pay attention to that. So in the rehearsal process, it's very um, democratic up to a point. In fact, I, I talked to Carrie recently and said, I think it's gotten to a point where there's so much stuff I have to keep in my head that let's kind of, I need to sort of cull it down a bit and make it a little more specific because the point is everything's in my head, and if I'm throwing stuff out and putting stuff in, whatever comes out or goes in has to stay part of the this architectural plan that I have in my head so that it always stays uh, structurally sound. And um, so that's um, been an interesting process. And